Before we start, two announcements. The first, I forgot to include the um, slide. But there's something called the Nationale Studenten Enquête, the National Student Survey. Anybody's never heard of this? Okay, so this is when you go to the toilets and you see a little big affiche in the toilets. It announces the National Student Survey. Um, and I've been, oops, sorry, I've been told that the um, turn out the people from the uh, IMM from AI and from computer science who haven't filled this in. Um, a lot of people from, uh, from these uh, courses haven't filled this in, so we really um, need to shore up the numbers a little bit. So especially if you're a computer scientist of any kind of flavor, please go to the website and fill this in. I'll give another uh, reminder on Thursday and actually include the slide, but I'm sure you've all got an email reminding you of the National Student Survey. Uh, so please fill this in because we really need the numbers to, to draw any conclusions. And apparently people from other uh, courses really are filling them in. So uh, that's uh, 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 thing one that I wanted to mention. Thing two, uh, on a more positive note, this is kind of a special point in the course because um, next week's homework, uh, next week there is no homework. Next week's homework is the um, practice exams. So next week during the this week during the homework session we will discuss the uh, topics from last week. But um, next week we'll the discuss the practice exams, which means that this is sort of the point when everything we will cover uh, in the homework has been discussed. So there's four lectures left, but none of them will be discussed in the homework, which means. I can't ask you any complicated questions about the stuff that's coming. So uh, there will be exam questions about these last four lectures, but not complicated exam questions. So if you, and there will be some math in the lectures that follows, follow, but if you can't understand any of the details, if you can't understand any of the math, I mean, feel free to ask me, of course, but if you don't feel like digging deep, you can sit back and relax and think it won't come up during the exam. It will come up in easy questions, but it won't come up in difficult questions. So we've sort of, we've had the difficult part. Uh, so we can sort of sit back and relax a little bit more. Uh, nevertheless, we're gonna discuss some interesting things and some complicated things. And today's topic is uh, sequential data. So we're going to take this, oops, sorry, my, Clicker doesn't seem to work. One second. Oh, restart Bluetooth. There we go, okay. Um, so what we're going to do today is we are going to move away from this basic recipe of machine learning today and in the following weeks. And we're going to look at some settings where the basic recipe doesn't really apply. Where we need a slightly different setting, a slightly different recipe. Uh, and today we're going to look at what happens if our data is arranged in a sequence. Uh, so we'll start by just uh, l looking at what that means, what that might mean, what kind of data we might encounter and what it might look like. And then we'll look at some simple models to attack such problems and simplest are probably Markov models. And then we'll look at embedding models, which is a slightly more complicated, more neural networky way to do it. That should be about where the break happens, who knows? <laughs> 
And then we'll look at RNNs, which are a neural network, but a neural network that can um, sort of understand time, it can understand sequences. And then probably the most famous instance of a recurrent neural network is an LSTM, uh, which we'll discuss in depth. And then we'll finish up by looking at some ways to, uh, to apply LSTMs and to apply neural networks like this. Um, yeah, but let's start with um, sequences. What kind of sequen sequential data might we run into, might we encounter, and what might that mean? Uh, so the simplest case is the one-dimensional sequence the, sorry, the sequence of one-dimensional numeric data. So just a sequence in time of numbers. Here, for instance, we have the number of sunspots observed per month, I think, or year, something like that, um, which is just a sequence over time of numbers, uh, which is something we might like to predict or analyze. We'll get into that later. Second, while I disconnect the microphone, uh, you still hear me? Yeah. And of course, you can also have multiple, multiple dimensions. So for every point in time, you get, for instance, two numbers. Here, I've plotted the uh, closing index of the Amsterdam Exchange versus the FTSE 100, I think. Uh, and then you get a sort of two-dimensional time series. So you have one time dimensions and two value dimensions to features, uh, which gives you sort of uh, different things to predict. So you can predict one value from the other. You can predict the Amsterdam value from the FTSE value, or you can predict the Amsterdam value from the historic uh, Amsterdam values, stuff like that. So you can do lots of different things with this kind of data. Uh, you can also get something analogous to a categorical feature which is symbolic data, like language. So you again have, have data arranged in a sequence, but every aspect, every step of time in your data, you get one discrete value from a large possible uh, number of discrete values from your vocabulary. So here you get one word per time step out of a large possible number of words. Or you can take the same sentence and you can model it as a character level sequence, a sequence of characters. So for every time step, you get a character. Uh, so you get many more time steps, and you get a much smaller vocabulary, because there are many fewer characters than words. Uh, and both settings, both ways of doing things have their, uh, have their benefits. So that's sort of an analog of the, the uh, categorical feature that we've seen in the classical setting. It's the symbolic sequence. And you can even have multiple symbols per time step. So here we have, for instance, a linguistic sequence with post tags, part of speech tags. So for every word, we also have a tag indicating whether it's an article or a noun or a verb and so on. So then you get two dimensional feature. You get two symbols for every time step. And you can even get much more complicated stuff like a, a musical sequence, which is a sequence of symbols because musical notes uh, well, there are usually about uh, 88 possible musical notes that you can play. But you can play multiple notes at the same time. And here you even have the problem of timing, which we won't go into, but uh, certain notes happen at specific times. So that can be tricky to model. Uh, we won't go into this too much. For now, we will stick with um, mostly one-dimensional data, one-dimensional sequences. Uh, we won't go into the multi-dimensional stuff too much. So those are the sequences you might encounter, mostly symbolic or uh, numeric. And then there's a question of what kind of machine learning do we want to do on these kinds of sequences, which sort of falls apart into more settings, two more ways of doing things, uh, which I've termed the single sequence or the set of sequences. Um, so in this case, we have some uh, spam data uh, email spam classification, and every email in this setting, uh, ev every instance sorry, in this uh, data set is a sequence. Uh, so we have a sequence of characters or a sequence of words. One sequence is one email, and we have a large set of different sequences. And every sequence has a label that we're trying to predict. 
namely hammer span, which is very different from the setting here, where we have just one sequence, like uh, sunspots or uh, uh, stock market prices, and we're actually trying to predict the next value given the previous values. It's a very different type of setting. Um, so let's look at the single sequence uh, setting first. We can turn that into a relatively something that's relatively close to our classical setting by simply looking at the, uh, let's say this, the, this here at the end is the current value we're trying to predict. We can extract some features for it by just looking at the previous n values, in this case, the previous three values. So then we can turn our data, our single sequence, into a table like this, where the target value is just one particular value in our sequence, and the features are just the three preceding values. That's what we're trying to predict. Uh, which gives us a big table, like we're used to, big table of instances, three features, one target value, so it's a fairly straightforward reg regression problem, which we can feed to a typical regression learner like um, a linear regression, for instance, or a regression tree. And then, once we get out of our training data, once we get some test data, or we use this in production, we just record the last three values of that we've observed, and when we want to predict the next value, we just feed those last three values to our regression model and predict the next value. So that's a sort of very simple, very straightforward way of uh, predicting the value of a sequence by just translating it to this classical setting, training a model, and uh, using that to predict. The drawback here is that, um, or the drawback, or the one thing that we have to think about, that we have to be careful about, uh, is that we think about our real-world use case. So the real-world use case is that we use this model to predict uh, based on things that it's seen in the past to predict the future which is usually what we want to do. Um, so what we can't do in this setting here, uh, well, what we have to be careful about is splitting off our test and validation data. Because if we just randomly shuffle the rows in this data set and randomly assign some, ro uh, sorry, uh, yeah, the rows in this data set and randomly assign some rows to the test set and randomly assign some rows to the uh, training data, what we get is a model that during its training time has access to stuff that happened later than stuff that happened in the tra that happens in the test data. If you see what I mean. Uh, and the same goes for the validation data. So that's something you don't want because it might be um, because that's something that had doesn't happen in production. In production you only have access to training examples through these rows that happened in the past, because the future hasn't happened yet. Uh, so that's what you want to replicate with your test set, with your test and your training split, and with your validation and your training split. So what you should do is something called walk forward validation, which looks like this. If we, so we keep our data set ordered in time, or according to time. So all these rows, they are ordered, and we don't shuffle them and we split at one point in time. So everything after that point in time becomes our test set, and after everything before becomes our training data. And then if we want to do multiple validation runs, if we want to do something s sort of uh, synonymous with cross-validation, we basically pick some point in time and we take a small slice of our training data, maybe just one instance or a couple of instances, and everything before that becomes our training data and everything after becomes a validation data, we train on the training data, we test on the validation data, and we get some error. And we walk forward the validation data, constantly training on everything that happened before that. And then we average over all the different values we've, we'd have, we've observed. And then we can make sure that we're always testing on data that happened later, that happened after our training data. And then once, come, once we've done all our hyperparameter selection and everything we want to do on the validation data, and it comes time to test on our test data, we do the same within our test data. 
So we s either we just do one training pass on, so we once predict all the test data. We train once on all the training data and then just predict all the test data. Or if we want to do sort of more up to the minute predictions, we can retrain on bits of our test data, but we always have to train on stuff that happened before the specific thing that we're testing on. That's called walk forward validation. And these kinds of things are important when you sort of start deviating from the basic mechanism, from the basic recipe of machine learning. Uh, it's important to uh, take these things into account. So that's sequential data. Um, yeah, so you can do this kind of feature extraction and then just run a normal model on your uh, on your test data. Uh, sorry, uh, turn it into a, a data set for your basic machine learning algorithm. Uh, but you have to be careful about validation and about training. And for the rest of the lecture, we are going to try to um, define some models that are a little bit closer to consuming sequences as sequences, that sort of understand what sequential data is and are designed to, to actually handle uh, sequential data. And for most of the lecture, we'll stick to one-dimensional uh, one symbolic sequences. And the extension to other forms of data is usually pretty trivial, so you can usually figure that out for yourself if you need it. So for now, we'll stick to symbolic sequences. And the first model we'll look at, this Markov model, is a probabilistic model. So we're going to model the sequence of a particular probability. So let's start with this uh, message, this sentence that you might um, find in an email. Congratulations, you have won a prize. And we'll do word level modeling, so we'll split it up into a sequence of words. And the way to model this as probability is usually to uh, make every word in the sentence a separate random variable. So we have six random variables in this case, w1 through six, and these can each uh, take the value of a particular word in our vocabulary. So what is the prob the probability that we're after is the probability that word one takes the value congratulations, word two takes the value you, and so on and so on. And we'll assume for the moment that all our sentences have the same length. So we know beforehand that our sentences that our sentence has length six. So this is the probability distribution that we want to define. And then later to fit to our data. Um, which is a um, joint probability distribution over six random variables. Which is difficult to define in one go, so we want to break it up, we want to sort of decompose it. And we're going to do that using this uh, rule that I warned you was going to be very useful. This uh, basically rewritten, rewriting the definition of a conditional entropy. So if we see some joint distribution, we can break it up into a conditional distribution and a marginal distribution over the conditional. And we're just going to apply this to our uh, this previous joint distribution a couple of times. That's called the chain rule. The result of that is called the chain rule of probability. So it's very important at this point that I disambiguate and say this chain rule has nothing to do with the other chain rule that we know. We know a chain rule of calculus. It's a completely different chain rule, no relation. Um, and we just take this kind of uh, joint probabilities, multiple random variables, and we just apply the uh, previous rule that I showed you, this conditional rule, step by step. So here we take out, we make this a conditional on W1, and then we multiply by the uh, marginal distribution on W1. And then we do the same thing for W2. So what we see is that we get a conditional on W2 given W1, and then W2 is moved to the conditional. And then we do the same thing with W3. So we get this sequence, this product of conditional distributions where every W is conditioned on uh, the Ws that precede it. And you can do this in any order. You don't have to do this in the order of the sequence. You can start with W1 and W, then W3 and then W2. But it makes sense, given the way language works, given the way sequences work, 
to condition every word, if it's a sentence and W are the words, to condition every word on the words that came before it. Because that's sort of how we process language as well, right? We uh, process language word by word. It comes to you in a sequence, one by one. And we sort of create an expectation over the next word given what you've heard already. So this makes sense. If you apply the chain rule in this way, it makes a lot of sense for language. So that's what we do. And now, the give, if we want to pro the probability over a whole sentence, we can decompose it like this. And then the probabilities that we have to figure out are probabilities like this. Conditional probabilities. What is the probability of seeing this word given that you've seen these words already, given this history? And if we can figure those out, then we can figure out the probability of a whole sentence, and then we can start building language models. Uh, so here's that. Repeat it again in, in log probability. So if you take the log probability of a sentence, uh, then it decomposes into a sum of these conditional probabilities, conditional log probabilities in this case. Uh, and if you're ever implementing this kind of thing, it's good to use log probabilities instead of probabilities, because the probability of a particular word gets very, very low, right? If you have a vocabulary of 10,000, then even if every word is as likely as every other word, there'll still be, the probabilities will still be one in 10,000. And then you start multiplying these very small probabilities with each other. They get even smaller. Um, so before you know it, you get sort of um, floating point underflows. It's too small to be represented by a computer. So it's good to take the logarithm so that you avoid these overflow, uh, underflows if you're ever implementing this. If you're not, then don't worry about that. Uh, but this is what we've been talking about. So this is we, to work out the probability of a sentence, we decompose it into a product of these conditionals. Um, so it's a good to um, think a little bit about what this kind of language model would uh, ideally tell us, how a sort of ideal language model works, uh, how these, uh, yeah, so this, uh, this basically this simple function of W given history should encompass a lot, not just about the way language works or the kind of words we expect, but also, strictly speaking, if it works ideally, about the way the world works and about physical properties. So what you see here is uh, four completions of this sentence, the man fell out of the. And something like window is, very, is a very probable completion of this, uh, of this sentence, so that should get a high probability. It's not only a likely scenario, but it also fits grammatically. And then the man fell out of the aquarium. That's something that is physically possible, but slightly unlikely. Uh, so you would want that ultimately to get a lower probability. But all that kind of intelligence and common sense reasoning would be encapsulated ideally in an ideal language model. Then the man fell out of the pool. That's something that is, in a normal pool, would be more or less physically impossible. So it's still grammatical, but it's sort of inconceivable, so you would want that ev to have an even lower probability than aquarium. And then something like the man fell out of the cycling, that's actually not grammatical, so you want would want that to have the lowest probability. So even though this looks like a very simple function, and we will approximate it with very simple functions, the ideal language model actually contains sort of all of human intelligence, almost. So we can't do that, we can't build that function yet. So for now, let's start with a very, very simple approximation based on something called the Markov assumption, which is simply the assumption that we have a finite memory. It's a little bit like the naive Bayes assumption. So we just assume that the probability of a word depends only on, its last, on the last two words we've seen. This is not true, but it does make things a lot simpler. And things still work pretty well. It's that kind of assumption. So then we can take this uh, decomposition of this sentence, you have won a congratulations, you have won a prize, and break it apart into conditionals on only the last two words. And if we have a big, uh, big data set of data, uh, big set of data, big uh, set of language called a corpus, a uh, data set of a big bag of language is called a corpus. What we can do is we can just estimate these probabilities in a very straightforward way just by counting how many times things occur in our data. 
So to count the, uh, to estimate the probability that the word price follows the word A and one, we just tally up how much, ta how many times we see the two word phrase one A, and then how many times we see the three word phrase one a price. In other words, what's the probability that the word, that the sequence one A is followed by the sequence price. And if we divide those two frequency val by, each other, uh, by each other in this way, then we get a good approximation of this probability. That gives us a very simple, combining these two things, the Markov assumption with the simple way of approximating probabilities, gives us a very simple language model. Um, which we can use to do different things. Uh, we'll start with uh, sequential sampling, which is a sort of interesting way to test what your language model is capable of. So let's assume we've tallied up all these frequencies. We have this Markov model. We start with a small seed sequence of a couple of uh, words. In the case of a Markov model, two words is enough. And then we, uh, through a uh, an iterative loop, we sample, continuously sample the next word. So we have two words to start, or three words to start with. We compute the probability of the next word given those three words. We sample from that probability distribution. So we don't necessarily pick the word with the highest probability. We just sample it from that probability distribution. We append that word to the sequence, and we keep going and going and going. So if you do that with something like Shakespeare, it's a common uh, way to test it. So we train on a corpus of Shakespeare. Well, train, we compute these frequencies on a corpus of Shakespeare. And we do this, this sequential sampling on that uh, on that pro the resulting probability distribution. You get something like this, which looks pretty convincing, sort of at first sight. If you start re keep reading for a while, you see that the grammaticality sort of tails off after a few words. You still get interesting phrases like "Is thy son to church ready to love now?" Dot grace that I beseech your high majesty, which I mean. If you're not a Shakespeare scholar, then you wouldn't be surprised to see that uh, as part of some a bit of Shakespeare. Uh, so that's a Markov model, and that's a way to generate text with a Markov model. And you can sort of inspect this to see how convincingly you've modeled your text. Even with this finite memory, you get a pretty convincing model of text. So once you're convinced about this, and you think, well, that's a pretty decent model, you can use this to do classification. And all you need to turn this into fan classification is to condition, take this probability and work out a conditional probability on the class. So what we're ultimately after is, given one of these email messages, what is the probability that it's spam? Which is what you see here. Given, congratulations, you have won a prize. Given that I see this in my email inbox, what is the probability that, that the email is spam? And what we do is we use this uh, approach of a base classifier. We turn this into a gen, uh, we use a generative classifier, so instead of modeling the probability of spam given the words directly, we model the words using a language model given that there's uh, spam, and we multiply by the uh, prior probability of the class spam. The second one, this prior probability, we can just uh, infer from data, just see how many, how many spam emails uh, we get on average. So we'll focus on this left uh, factor here. It's basically a language model like we've been building so far, except this time it's conditioned on spam. So we do the same thing we did before. We take this uh, um, probability of the, se of the sentence, except now it's conditioned on spam, and we use the chain rule to decompose it into conditional probabilities. We use the Markov assumption to condition every word only on the previous wor two words. And then we estimate this prob uh, these conditional probabilities of every word given the last two words. We estimate based on the data, but we compute the frequencies only from the spam part of our data. So our data set has a large text, a large corpus of uh, ham messages and a large corpus of spam messages, and we compute these frequencies only on the spam messages to get the probability that this part, that in a spam email, the words 1a are followed by price. So here with a little bit more precision is the uh, Markov model. So we count what are called n-grams, which are these sequences of multiple tokens. So a, a 
a sequence of three tokens is called a trigram, a sequence of two tokens is called a bigram, and a sequence of n tokens is called an n-gram. We count that for every class separately, and then we model the probability of a sequence given a class. And we turn this around using Bayes' rule, and then we get uh, two class probabilities, so we can just pick the biggest. And that's Markov modeling. Uh, yeah, a couple of uh, technical things. Usually, uh, at least for spam, a zero order Markov model works just as well as a one, two, or three order Markov model. Uh, so with a zero order Markov model, you don't condition on anything. With one order Markov model, you condition on the last word to order, on the last two words, and so on. So a zero order Markov model works just as well as any other for spam, but for other tasks, it might be different. Um, Yeah, um, uh, sometimes you, uh, if you have a, a, a classification model, it doesn't matter, but for other language models, it should, you should be aware that short documents or short sentences are vastly more likely than long sentences because you're multiplying these probabilities. So the longer the sentence goes, the, uh, as the sentence goes longer, the probability decays exponentially. So you need to correct for that if you're comparing different sentences. But if you're doing classification, you're just comparing the class for the same sentence, so then it doesn't matter. And same as before, you can apply Laplace smoothing, which would look like this, where uh, you said V is your vocabulary. So uh, if you want to uh, add one to the frequency of every trigram, then you need to add uh, the cardinality of V cubed to the frequency of every bigram. So that's Markov models, um, which work very well, but they have uh, one important problem, which is that they treat words as a kind of atomic symbols. They don't look at the fact that words, different words have similar meanings. So for instance, here, if we see the same thing again, the man fell out of the pool. Uh, oh, that last thing says cycling, it doesn't matter. So let's say we have, um, Another word that fits grammatically, gazebo, which should, it's a noun, so it fits grammatically, so it should get a higher probability than cycling, but it just so happens that we've never seen it before. So we can use smoothing to work out the probabilities, but actually, or we've never seen it in this context before, but from other places where we've seen gazebo, we might be able to work out that it's a noun, so it should actually get a higher probability than cycling. Or in another case, if you have a sentence like, congratulations, you've won a prize, which you've seen a lot in your uh, training data. If you then see congrats, a reward has been awarded to you. None of the, almost none of these words match the words from your training data. So a uh, straight Markov model would not be able to infer from this training data that this is likely to be spam. In order to do that, you need a kind of, well, one thing you can uh, do to fix this is to sort of match words to each other or to sort of model that words are not just atomic objects, but they actually have similarities in meaning. And uh, a very good way to do this, that is with an embedding model. So embedding models are basically situations where you have a uh, set of objects, set of discrete set of objects, and you model every single object with a vector. So for object x, we just assign it a vector ex, and we take the similarity of those two vectors according to dot product or according to Euclidean distance uh, to be the similarity between the objects that they represent. So the more similar the objects x and y are, the more similar the ob the, uh, their corresponding vectors are. And then we learn in some way, which we'll uh, define for this specific case, but in some way we then have to decide how are we going to learn the parameters, the values that are in these, uh, in these vectors. So it's a little bit like computing latent vectors through outer encoders, which we already saw, where we take images and we compute for the images this vector representation. And in this space you have things like a smile vector and you can do interpolation, stuff like that. So it's a little bit like that, but we want to do it for a discrete set of objects. <coughs> 
Uh, and for words, we can do this by making use of something called the distributional hypothesis, which state that if we look at the um, look at a word and look at the different contexts in which it occurs, and context here means just basically the two words to the left of it and the two words to the right of it, or a larger window if you like, but we just look at the words to the left and to the right of the word, and we s look at, for all the occurrences of the word in our corpus, we look which other words occur nearby. Um, that distribution is a good proxy for the meaning of the words. So words that occur near similar words can often mean the same thing. That's called the distributional hypothesis, and it's a good way to sort of uh, compute a proxy for meaning. And that brings us to the word of vec algorithm, which uh, basically applies this uh, distributional hypothesis to do an embedding, to compute an embedding. Uh, so before we apply the word of vec algorithm, we need a representation. This is going to be a neural network, so we need a representation of the words before we get this embedding. And we just start with a one-hot vector for every word. So we get these huge one-hot vectors. Let's say we have 100,000 words. We get very long vectors of 100,000 that are entirely zero except one element is one, and that element corresponds to the word. For cat, we get a big long, uh, long one-hot vector with one, one somewhere in the middle that represents the word cat. So we just do a one-hot coding of the, the entire vocabulary. Then. We take a sliding window, in this case of five words, but it could be larger as well, uh, but of an odd number of words, because the middle part of the sliding window is always the word that we're focusing on. And as we slide the window along the uh, text, along the entire corpus, we tally up this data set of source word X and target word Y. And for every word in the context that we encounter in this context of the word X, we add one row to our table. So we're going to train a model that given compare will predict both shell, I, the, and two, and any other word that uh, compare will uh, uh, see in its context. And what we do then is we feed this data set of paired words to a very, very simple neural network where this uh, one hot encoded X goes into a linear layer. Let's say if we do it with, uh, we take a vocabulary of 10,000 words, we uh, map this from 10,000, uh, this linear layer maps this input of 10,000 to an output of 300. That's our embedding space. And then we map this output of 300 back to, the to a probability distribution on the vocabulary. So we get an output of 10,000 nodes We apply a softmax to that, so it becomes a probability distribution. And under that probability distribution, these output words should be high. So we're modeling a probability distribution on the words that occur in the context of X. And then we do that for the whole, uh, for the whole corpus, the whole big corpus, until it uh, sort of uh, the training converges. Then we discard the top part of this uh, model and we use the bottom part as an encoding to our embedding space. So if we now want the embedding for the word cat, we just feed that one hot vector for cat into this model and we get out the embedding. Which you can see as a, a, a mapping from this one hot vector to this embedding space. Uh, and I was talking about this once uh, after a conference with another uh, researcher who had actually worked a lot with uh, word to vec And I had this view in my head. I thought I'd read the paper very accurately, and I thought about it like this, like a mapping from a one-hot vector to an embedding. And she said, no, that, that's not how it works. It's, uh, it's actually a lookup table. You just learn the embeddings directly, and you just look it up. So the, you say, cat is the 120th word. So you just look up the 120th embedding vector in your table. So I was very confused because I read the paper multiple times and I thought I had it very accurately in my head. And then I went home and I looked it up and I realized, I figured out using a, uh, some uh, uh, blog posts, that actually it's sort of the same thing. So if you multiply one hot vector, because if you multiply one hot vector, 
by a matrix, as we've done here, what you're doing is essentially selecting one of the columns of the matrix, which I knew, but it hadn't occurred to me at the time. So you can think of this as a mapping from some X to some embedding vector, but really what you're training is just these, this matrix here of this linear uh, mapping is just a big table of your embeddings because the jth column in that uh, matrix is going to be the jth embedding vector. So it's really just a matter of perspective. Anyway, once you've done this, you get these embedding vectors and from the embedding vectors encoded in these embedding vectors somehow is this probability distribution on the context of the word. Then you can look at what these embedding vectors do, what they mean, and there's a, here's a very uh, famous example of, of one of the things you can do. It doesn't always work, but uh, it, it works in, uh, in some specific cases, including this one. So if you look at the embedding vector for a woman and you subtract the embedding vector for a man, you get a kind of direction in your embedding space in which things become more feminine. So the direction between king and queen or the direction between, so uh, this is the vector we are uh, computing here by subtracting man from woman, so we get that vector. And it turns out that the vector between uncle and aunt or between king and queen is roughly the same, which means that you can compute that vector and add it to a male word like king. And the place where you end up, you can sort of see for that place which embedding in your, um, in your corpus is the closest to that and that will be the embedding for queen. So you get this kind of smile vector type thing, this the type layout, but for words instead of images. Uh, like I say, it doesn't always work. These examples are a little bit cherry picked, but uh, practically these embeddings, these word embeddings are very good and, and they're very helpful. Uh, yeah, so uh, distances and directions specifically reflect semantic meaning uh, pretty well. And these are great starting points because now we have a vector representation, a dense vector representation for our words and we can map a, a model of sequence, a sentence like a sequence of these, uh, these vec vectors and then we can feed that to, to bigger or more complicated neural networks. Um, and Google has very helpfully trained a huge word to vec uh, model on a, uh, I think a terabyte sized news corpus, so a huge amount of text. And you can just download these embeddings for 100,000 or a million words and use them in your own project. So you don't have to do, you don't actually have to do this training, you can just download the word to vec embeddings and use them in your own project. It's another way to sort of avoid doing this really expensive training of deep learning. So that's embedding models. We will probably look at some more embedding models on Thursday in different settings. So the principle of embedding discrete objects as vectors we will return to. But for now, this is uh, all we'll say about it. Which brings us to the break. So let's take 15 minutes. I'll try and see what I can do about this echo. And then we'll uh, continue with recurrent neural networks. All right, let's get started again. Um, I'll try and stand over here so that it doesn't echo so much. Um, let's do it like this. So we've talked about some very sort of uh, simple, simple ways of, of, of doing um, modeling sequences. Uh, and basically the second half of this lecture is how to model, about how to model sequences uh, in deep learning systems basically, how to, to use some of this power of, of really deep neural networks uh, to, to um, come up with machine learning systems that really go from the raw data to the desired output. Um, so here's an example, let's start with a simple example, a uh, very simple symbolic sequence, uh, monophonic music in one octave, so we just have uh, seven possible notes that we can play. We represent each as a one-hot vector. So our melody, ignoring the specific timing of the notes for, uh, for the moment, becomes a sequence of one-hot vectors of uh, length seven. So basically we can represent our sequence as a matrix of two, uh, two axes, two dimensions, and one matrix is which note we're playing and the other ma matrix is the uh, time. 
And then our whole data set, if we have multiple of these sequences, of these very simple bits of music, our whole data set looks oh, uh, like this. So our whole data set is a bunch of matrices, but the sequences might have different lengths. So we can't stick this into a three tensor uh, in a natural way because every sequence has a different length. So we have to consider it as a bag of matrices, which is fine. We can just uh, try and learn on a, a bag of matrices. And we, in fact, we want models, we want to define model sequence models that are innately capable of um, operating on sequences of different lengths. That's sort of a, a defining trait of a sequence model is that we can train it on sequences of a certain length and then give it sequences that are longer and it still works. So we actually want that. Uh, only for a single batch, it's, it's usually important to uh, feed the batch as a single tensor. So what we do per batch is we look at the length of the l longest sequence in the batch and then we pad the rest of the sequence to be that length. Little superfluous animation here. Uh, and then we have a batch of four sequences in this case that are all the same length. So now we can put them in the, into a three tensor where one dimension is which node we're playing, one dimension is time, and one dimension is all the instances. Uh, and per batch, we can change the length. So usually what you do is you sort your data by length uh, and then group it into batches so that all batches have roughly the same length, and then you pad them out to make them exactly the same length. So now we have some data that we can feed to a neural network because it's a tensor, so we can use this deep learning idea of feeding tensors to neural networks. So now the question is, how do we model time? How do we model sequences? How do we model time with neural networks? And um, one of the earliest approaches of doing that, uh, earliest approaches, one of the earliest ways of doing that, is to give your neural network a recurrent connection. Which here you see a very simple uh, example. I think this might be an Elman network or a Jordan network. I forget the uh, exact um, terminology. That doesn't really matter. Basically, this is a neural network where we have a we have our standard feed-forward network, except appended to the input is uh, are some uh, orange nodes called H here, which take the um, yeah, which have a recurrent connection, basically a connection that allows a cycle in the network to the hidden layer. So basically, as we compute the network forward from the bottom, the hidden layer of the previous, uh, uh, sorry, uh, as we compute the new hidden layer, the previous hidden layer gets copied to these input nodes. So we have a kind of cycle. And in order to... Um, uh, basically, uh, our no this kind of notation is going to get very complicated very soon as we start getting into LSTM. So we have to simplify our visual shorthand a little bit. So this is the, the uh, visual language for this lecture. We have a vector, that's our input, and we represent a vector as a sort of rectangular bar. And a vector can be used to compute another vector by multiplying it by a weight matrix. and adding a bias usually, but we'll forget about the bias. We will take the bias as red. We'll assume that whenever there's a weight matrix, there's also a bias vector. And that results in a, a hidden layer, and the hidden layer then feeds into the output. So this is a standard two-layer feed-forward network in this compressed uh, representation. Uh, oh yeah, and I should also mention that everything that follows the specific exposition is largely taken from this blog post by Chris Ola which is also part of the required reading. Um, so now we can represent a recurrent neural network by including this recurrent connection in our uh, diagram. And whenever two lines meet like this, we will assume that the two uh, vectors on those lines are concatenated and then fed to the result. So here what we have is we concatenate X with the previous hidden, uh, hidden layer we can get the two and feed them through the weight matrix to generate the next hidden layer. And now what we can do to feed this neural network a sequence and get out a sequence is we feed it the first uh, 
input in our current sequence. So this might be a single number or it might be vectors numbers uh, or it might be a one hot coded symbol. We do a forward uh, pass on the network. We assume that the hidden layer is just zero so we concatenate a zero vector to this, feed it to the network and we get Y1 out. Then we feed it the second element in our sequence and now we compute H2 by moving the previous hidden vector that was based on H1, concatenating it to X2 and feeding that forward to the network that gives us H2. So some information about X1 is now encoded in this hidden layer here that we've uh, cycled around. And then for X3 we do the same thing. So now uh, we compute H3 by cycling around H2 on the, uh, on the recurrent connection, concatenating it to X3, feeding it through the weights, and we get H3. And now H3 potentially contains information, depending on what the weights are, about both X3, X2, and X1, because all of those have sort of traveled through this recurrent connection, and we use that to produce Y3. So Y3, whatever our uh, output Y3 is, can depend not only on X3, but also on X2 and X1. And in that sense, it's a sequence model. So usually you train these networks, if you're training just the recurrent neural networks, you train it in a sequence to sequence setting. You have an input sequence and an output sequence. That's our basic setting. And uh, we train these neural networks. That's of course the difficult part. How do we train these neural networks? Uh, through something called backpropagation through time. Because, uh, let me just go back one second. Uh, the standard backpropagation approach doesn't really apply here. Because we get some error here. Y3 should have some different values, so it's an error, and we try and backpropagate it. We can backpropagate it this way down to X3. But how do we backpropagate through this recurrent layer? Because by now, the hidden layer has changed. So how do we backpropagate sort of backwards into the past if the past, if this uh, layer has been overwritten? And what we do in order to, uh, well, the, the, the easiest way to visualize this uh, the solution is to unroll the network. So instead of shifting the sequence, we keep the sequence as is. We just feed the sequence in one big go. And we feed separate copies of the network to each time step in the sequence. And now the recurrent network doesn't go back onto itself. The recurrent, uh, the recurrent connection doesn't go back onto the same network. It goes from the previous copy of the network to the next copy of the network. So this is basically a kind of unrolling over time of the recurrent neural network, which turns it into one big feed-forward network where we just say, this is just a big feed-forward network, except all of these parameters within the network have to have the same value. We can train the parameters to be whatever, but they have to, these weights are coupled. Which we've seen before, that also happens in the um, convolutional neural network. So we know we can handle that, we know we can deal with that. Um, so if we look at this recurrent neural network like this, there's no problem because we can just treat this as a big feed-forward uh, big feed-forward network with no recurrent connections. So now we don't have any cycles anymore because the recurrent con what was a recurrent connection now goes from one copy of the network to another copy of the network. We we'll just feed it the whole sequence in one go and get out the whole sequence in one go. And now if we have a error signal here, starting from, let's say, uh, Y6, we compare the output sequence to a target sequence. We get some error, let's say, at the end of the uh, sequence, and we can backpropagate all the way through the network, through time, as it were, back to the original weights. And we get a gradient over the weights for every particular instance in time. We just sum up those weights uh, so sum up those gradients and update the weights accordingly. So now we can just train. Uh, this is basically, this is called backpropagation through time, but it's basically just a matter of unrolling your network over time. So how do we use these, uh, what can we use these RNNs? What can we do with them? Uh, well, obviously we can do sequence to sequence learning. 
right? If our data set consists of an input sequence that should be mapped to a particular output sequence, then that's called sequence to sequence learning, and we just feed it the input sequence, observe the difference between the output and the desired output, and backpropagate that. Which is, for instance, if you want to translate English to friends, French, uh, you might model that as a sequence to sequence problem, or if you want to transpose music, you might model that as a sequence to sequence problem. You can also do sequence to label, like this band classification, so your sequence goes in and a label comes out, or you can do label to sequence, or nothing to sequence, which is basically generating language, like this uh, sequential generation that we saw earlier. So sequence to sequence is pretty straightforward. We have an input sequence and we have a target sequence and we just compute the difference and backpropagate it. If we want to do sequence to label, one thing we can do is just ignore all the outputs except the last one and map this to a label. Use a single neural network to just, uh, a fully connected layer to just map this to a label or just interpret this as the label and then just backpropagate compute an error only on the last element of the sequence and backpropagate that. Um, this is not ideal because if the first part of your input sequence is very useful to predicting the label, like in a spam email, if an email starts with congratulations, it might, it's very likely to be a spam email. In order for the network to learn that, there's a very long distance between the loss and the thing it has to learn. So the gradient has to travel a long time. Uh, so it's sort of more likely to learn from the last part of your sequence than the first part of the sequence, which you don't want, that kind of asymmetry. So it's more common to take the whole output of the whole sequence, average it, and make that the label. Because now the network at any point can sort of output, after reading the first word, I'm pretty sure it's, an e it's a spam email, um, and it has sort of more space, and at the end of the sequence it can also it can sort of change its mind. Um, but you do need to do something very simple here, like averaging, because you can't do a fully connected layer on top of this, because you need to be able to um, deal with variable sequence length. So if the length of this sequence changes, your model still needs to be able to adapt. And if your model is just a recurrent neural network, you can just add some more copies of the network, you can just average the output of a longer sequence. You can do all that. But if this last step is a fully connected network and you suddenly want to stretch it over a longer sequence, you will suddenly have more parameters. So that doesn't work. So whenever you do try and draw diagrams like this, you need to remember that the sequence length is variable. So whatever you do needs to work for different types of, uh, different lengths of sequences. Uh, labeled sequence you can do in two ways. You can just take your label, your input label, put it at, uh, uh, turn it into a sequence by repeating it n times and feeding that sort of constant sequence into the neural network to produce an output. Uh, but we have another input that we can use in the recurrent neural network, which is the hidden state at x zero. We said this was zero at, uh, at the beginning, but it's sort of up to us how we initialize the hidden state. So we can also initialize that with our input and just give the network zero vectors, a sequence of zero vectors, and then just train it to generate a sequence. Uh, this is useful, uh, we'll, we'll see later, this can be useful if you want to use the input for something else, but you also want to give it the sequence input for something else, but you also want to give it some label to condition on, and you sort of have two inputs for your recurrent neural network, so that can be quite useful. Those are different things you can do with recurrent neural networks. The problem is, if you do it like this, it doesn't work very well. Because recurrent neural networks, they uh, remember a little bit, they have a pretty decent memory, but they tend to forget things pretty fast. So after two or three words, they don't really remember anything that happened before that. Which kind of means that you might as well use a Markov model. I mean, the nice thing about a neural network, recurrent neural network, is that it has a potentially infinite memory compared to this Markov model, which has a finite memory. So if they don't remember their inputs for very long, then you might as well use a Markov model. Here's an example of why it can be important to remember your input. You have something like, I was born in France, blah, 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 blah. 
when I moved to Amsterdam, so I'm fluent in. It can be completed with different ways. Well, a Markov model is going to know that nobody's fluent in Aquarian, but a Markov model will not tell you whether French or Dutch are more likely. And uh, a model with very limited memory is also not going going to be able to tell you that. So you need really to have this quite long memory in order to remember that France was mentioned, and even though Amsterdam was mentioned later, it still means you're fluent in French because you were born in France, and you moved to Amsterdam, so that doesn't make you fluent in Dutch. Uh, so you need a long memory. And in order to have a long memory, what you need to do is forget lots of things, because if you have a limited memory, and you try and remember everything, then you will have a short memory, whereas if you have a limited memory and you're very selective in the things you remember, then you can remember things for a long time. So if you somehow recognize once this word occurs that it might be rec uh, relevant for the future and you remember it and you forget everything in between because you have this important thing in your memory, then you can have a long memory. So sort of uh, counterintuitively, the secret to remembering things for a long time is forgetting other things which is where the LSTM comes in, which is called the long short-term memory. It's basically a recurrent neural network that is built by uh, several learnable gates which decide which things we want to remember and which things we want to forget. And it's possibly, well, it's vying for um, prominence with the convolutional neural network for being the first properly deep neural network. So if you unroll network, it becomes a deep neural network work, multiple layers. Um, so both of these things were, uh, both the convolutional neural network and the LSTM were invented around 98. Um, so that's sort of a, a coin flip which one came first exactly, but basically this might be the uh, first deep neural network. And the basic mechanism uh, that it uses is this gate, so let's look at that in isolation first. Uh, which requires us to uh, introduce a new uh, activation function called the 10H, which I hadn't uh, mentioned before. So we know this sigmoid activation function, which squeezes its input into the range between 0 and 1, right? Uh, you can rescale that to the range between minus 1 and 1, and then it's called a 10H function. So it's just a weird, weird name for almost exactly the same thing, except with a slightly different output. And what a gate does in this con uh, context is it takes some input. From that input, it computes two vectors. One vector that are the, uh, oh yeah, and the output of the gate, let me say that first. So the output of the gate is a vector that we're going to add to something, right? We're going to, we have some memory in the LSTM and the output of this gate is sort of decides uh, how much of the input we're going to add to our memory. That's how you can think of it. So that's why I call it an additive vector. So the input first goes through uh, two roads. First, uh, one on the left is a transformation which is passed through a sigmoid function, so you get a vector of values between 0 and 1. And value on the right is passed through a 10H function, so you get values between 1 and minus 1. And you can think of this as the value on the right being the things we would like to add to the, um, yeah, to, the, uh, to the memory. And the value on the left selects which part of that we actually get to add. So the value on the left is a sort of holds us back and can uh, might dial back parts of our vector uh, in order to eliminate that and to retain what's in the memory. Because if you look at the values here, these are values between 0 and 1. So if we do an element-wise multiplication, if this sigmoid gives us all values near 0, then whatever happens on the right, we just get a vector that is all small values, so we are not adding very much. And if it's all values near 1, then we just get this uh, 10H activation, and then we're adding lots and lots of stuff about the input. And of course, it's a, a element-wise sigmoid, so it can do for ele every element in the vector, it can sort of decide how much of this do I want to add to the memory or how much do of this do I uh, want to cancel out and forget. 
Uh, so that's a kind of, uh, yeah, that's a gate. And the LSTM is basically a recurrent neural network built up of these gates. So without looking at what happens inside, let's look at the outside first. It's basically a recurrent neural network built up of cells. The cells are the guts of the recurrent neural network. It uh, takes an input, of course, at every time step. It provides an output at every time step. And between time step, it has two recurrent connections. So from one time step to the next, it uh, passes along two things. A value C, which is called the cell state, and a value Y, which is equal to the output. So it passes the output both as an output and to the next cell in the, um, in the time step, in the sequence. Um, before we look at what the cell looks like, what happens inside the cell, a little bit more visual notation, visual shorthand. So um, like I already said, if two lines meet, we concatenate the vectors represented by those two lines. If there's a W on a line, we apply weights to a vector. So we transform the vector by a linear transformation. Then we have a sigmoid activation, which we draw like this, and a tan H activation, which is the same but purple. And then there are element-wise operations like plus and uh, times, which just take two vectors and element-wise add them or element-wise multiply them, which look like this. So then this is the inside of the LSTM. It looks a bit complicated, but I'll try to go through it step by step. Um, so let's start here. This is sort of the spine or the conveyor belt of the LSTM. Basically, we have a, a the hidden state of the previous cell, which is manipulated by whatever happens below, which we haven't looked at, um, but only element-wise. So there's something multiplied by it and something added to it. And then that the result of that is passed to the next cell. So if we set this to, uh, to 1 and this to 0, if we multiply 1 by it and add 0 to it, then nothing happens to it. We just pass on the value we get in. That's why it's called the, but it's, uh, it's helpful to think of it as a conveyor belt. We just take whatever we get and we pass it along. Maybe we manipulate it a little bit, but if nothing happens, uh, then it's just passed along. There's no activation, there's no sigmoid or no 10H, which means uh, that um, the gradient doesn't decay. That's a very important reason why LSTMs work so well. There's no vanishing gradient along this thing because everything from very long ago can just, if so long as no cell decides to multiply anything or add anything, the value is just passed along this conveyor belt over the whole sequence. But sometimes we do want to look at the input and sometimes we do want to make the input manipulate our memory. So that happens in two places. Uh, this is the forget gate. So here we look at the input and the output of the previous two um, sequence, uh, of the previous step, sorry, the current input and the previous output. We concatenate them, pass them through a weight vector and sigmoid them. So we get a vector of values between zero and one. And that is multiplied by the memory. So this is saying, for instance, oh, we've got something interesting coming up. So we need to remove some stuff from our memory. We need to forget some stuff. We need to reduce the activations in our memory. In that case, you get lots of zeros or things near zero here. Uh, or if it's uh, just a stop word, if it's just the word the, nothing very interesting is happening. So output loads of, loads of ones. So we don't actually change what's in the memory. So now we've sort of cleared up the memory or not cleared up the memory. Now we need to decide which parts of the input we want to uh, actually add to the memory. So here we have this kind of two-way gate with a 10H and a sigmoid activation, uh, 10H activation and sigmoid activation. They're element-wise multiplied, and that value is added to the memory. And then all that's left to do is to decide what our current output is going to be, because we're outputting a sequence, so 
in addition to manipulating the memory, we also need to output uh, a, a value at the moment. So we get another sigmoid activated layer. We tan H activate the memory because everything, including XT, is now in the memory. So we use the current value to select what part of the memory we're going to output, and we use the 10H activation to control the uh, size of the output, to make the size of the output between minus one and plus one. That becomes our output. It goes out of the network, becomes YT, and it's passed to the next cell. That's a very complicated model. Uh, but hopefully that gives you some insight into how it works. So now let's see if that, complicated, uh, if that complication is warranted, if we can do something very interesting with this. And the most interesting thing, or the simplest most interesting thing that you can do with LSTMs probably is to um, sample from them, to build an LSTM language model, and to then do this sequential sampling. Uh, so we're going back to this idea of uh, predicting the next word given what has come befo before it or getting a probability distribution on the next word. And in order to do that, we can just train our model to predict the next word in the sequence. So we do sequence-to-sequence -sequence training, where we just provided a, a text, and we wanted to predict the next word. So the output, our target sequence, is just the input sequence shifted one step to the left. So it's very easy to train, very easy to find data la uh, label data. And in fact, because these models are so powerful, we're not going to do this with a word level sequence. We're going to do this with a character level sequence. So we feed it a sequence, we train it to predict the next word. And then we interpret the last output here. We add a softmax activation to all the outputs. And we interpret this uh, probability distribution provided by the softmax as the probability on the character we will see here, given this, uh, this history. So that gives us an implementation by LSTM of this kind of function, except it's now character level instead of uh, word level. And then we can do the same seeding step again, uh, so sequential sampling step again, where we start with a small sequence of uh, tokens, of characters in this case, we sample the next character according to the probability distribution, which is now defined by the uh, LSTM. In this case, we have to feed the whole seed to the network because the LSTM is not, uh, does not have this limited memory, so we have to feed the whole thing. Even if we sample 100 uh, characters, we feed all 100 characters to the network. It predicts the probability distribution on the next character from which we sample the next character, which we add to the seed and so on and so on, until we're, uh, we're happy with how much stuff we've generated, and then we have a look at what we've generated. Uh, this is also known as an autoregressive RNN. Uh, I didn't do these experiments, uh, somebody called Andre Karpathy did. Uh, you can read this blog post uh, where he explained how he did it and, and explains more about the nuts and bolts of this, but basically he did what I just explained. Um, so let's start with Shakespeare. So we get something similar to what we saw already, sort of similarly convincing. But remember that this is character level. So the neural network has actually, when it generates a sentence like the earth and thoughts of many, it has actually puzzled together that thoughts, words, and many, that those are English words. It has learned those words. It was not given those words, it learned them. It's learned that a name like Pandarus might be something that sounds pretty Shakespearean. It's learned to lay out stuff like this. It's learned to place commas. It's learned to place new lines. And it's learned a pretty decent approximation of an iambic pentameter, a meter that sounds Shakespearean. I uh, won't bother to read it out, but it sounds quite Shakespearean if you read it out. Uh, so this is much more impressive than the Markov model that we saw earlier. But even more impressive is that it can learn sort of um, syntax, 
So if you've ever, if you've ever edited a Wikipedia article, you know that it looks like this. It's this kind of markup text where links are, for instance, included with uh, double brackets, double square brackets. And this is all generated text, right? We feed it 100 megabytes of Wikipedia, we train it, and it learns this kind of syntax. So here it's learned to link to Antioch Perth. It's not where Antioch is. Uh, and a particular date. So it generates dates, it generates links, it generates strange words like since Dajaurt. And it basically gives you a pretty convincing Wikipedia article and it has this different mode. So it jumps into a link mode, it jumps into a URL mode here. Note that it's hallucinating a URL. If you click this link, you don't go to, to a Yahoo page. You go to a page that doesn't exist, but it looks, it has the structure of a, uh, of a known URL. And occasionally it even goes into HTML mode, so it suddenly starts, because Wikipedia pages have bits of HTML embedded. So then it starts into this, well, it's not HTML story, it's XML. It starts generating XML. And it has this sort of state machine structure that it sort of knows when it's done, it should generate a closing tag and then drop back to a different mode. Uh, finally, LaTeX, which I found most impressive because even I have trouble generating LaTeX that compiles. So it's quite impressive that the machine can do it. I have to say um, there were some mistakes. So they did manually fix some mistakes after they generated it. But then it compiled and then it generated all this kind of weird looking, impressive looking math. Uh, which I probably couldn't tell apart from a, a very high level mathematics paper. Oh yeah, and uh, probably the most famous example, at least a few years ago, was Deep Drum, where somebody trained an LSTM to generate character level uh, Donald Trump tweets. And you see, I think in square brackets, I don't see the seed in these ones. I don't know if the account is still active, but this was sort of uh, good fun for a while. Um, so um, that's more or less LSTMs. Just a couple more examples of how to apply these things and how to build these things into larger networks because we're doing deep learning now so we can chain different networks to do different things. For instance, we can, uh, going back to the last deep learning lecture, we can train a generator model, right? We saw if we sample a random uh, vector normally distributed vector and we feed it to a neural network, we get a random output which uh, can be quite nice and have a nice uh, complicated structure. So we can do that with a, an LSTM as well. We take a random sample, a random vector, we feed it to the network as the first hidden state and either use the inputs for something else or just zero them out. And then we can use, for instance, an autoencoder or a vari variational autoencoder to train that generator. So this is a complicated picture. But what we have is just a, an LSTM encoder network that gives us this, LS, uh, that gives us this VAE uh, parameters of the, the latent distribution. We do the sampling step that we know from the VAE, and then we get a VAE decoder network. So now all we have here is a, a variational autoencoder, except that the encoder and the decoder are LSTMs. Uh, there was supposed to be some music here. Hold on. No, it's only playing to the laptop. Uh, so these are. Let me hold on. I should. <laughs> I should explain this before I um, before I let you um, before I um, play it. Basically, what they did they uh, the music VAE they trained a neural network on very short snippets of MIDI music uh, so that these MIDI snippets would have a, a, a latent would get a latent representation, and then the uh, example that I tried to show you. Uh, or, or uh, play to you was an interpolation. So we start with this uh, first snippet that you heard, we end with the second snippet that you heard, 
And what you hear in between are all the snippets in between in the latent space. So we get a sort of one bar of music that slowly transforms from one snippet of music to the other snippet of music. Let's see if I can get this to play without freaking out the audio in it. Um, doesn't seem like it. just a with just this kind of sequence to sequence autoencoder if you want to do something more interesting like uh, modeling language you will need something called uh, teacher forcing where you basically combine this sequential sampling or this is predictive language model you combine it with an autoencoder so here we do two things. We have this autoencoder, which gives us a latent representation of the input. But then the decoder also gets access to the input itself. So it's predicting the next character. Uh, let's uh, point here to the O. It's predicting the O here, given both the latent representation of the sequence and the characters that preceded it. So we're sort of doing the best of both worlds here you're uh, doing a predictive language model and a latent representation. It's called teacher forcing. And here is a, a very nice model that uses this teacher forcing, which is a sketch RNN. Uh, it's called sketch RNN. And it's basically, it models um, sketches, human sketches. Google basically got millions and millions of people, you may have contributed to this yourself, to very quickly do a sketch of a particular subject, like a cat or a an owl, we have what we have here, owls and cats. And then somebody uh, trained a big variational um, sequence to sequence autoencoder on this with teacher forcing, which led to this latent space. So these are all generated sketches, not drawn by humans, but drawn by the neural network. And this is a grid interpolation of the latent space of this neural network. So you can actually, uh, oh yeah, so it's a sequence because you can draw, uh, uh, you model the drawing of the pen like a sequence of vectors that you hit along the path of the, when you're drawing this, uh, this shape. Um, and you can interpolate smoothly between one particular drawing of an owl and another type of drawing of an owl. And the same for the cat. And finally, well, we've heard this. And finally, I showed you this already, but you can also do the same thing with language where uh, I showed you that it doesn't really work if you use an autoencoder, but if you use a variational autoencoder, 
you get this kind of uh, pretty neat interpolation and, and uh, sampling of human sentences. And then I think the last one I wanted to show you was this um, image captioning task that I showed you earlier, which is not now which uh, is not an auto encoding task, but it's just a image to sequence task. Um, and all you need really for this is some good data. You need some volunteers with a lot of time to create captions for lots and lots of images. Well, that exists. That's called the MS Coco dataset, or just the Coco dataset, um, which basically contains loads of images from a dataset called uh, ImageNet. And for every image, it contains five human written uh, captions of what's happening in the image. And also lots of other things like bounding boxes and then uh, annotations of what's happening where, but we don't use that. So we just use the raw image and we use the uh, linguistic output. And what we can do as a very simple approach to this uh, model is just download one of these pre-trained image classification models, take off the classification layer and just uh, oops, sorry, map to uh, a latent space take that mapping, feed it to an LSTM, and train the LSTM end-to-end -to, -end to produce the caption. So we just uh, feed in an image, whatever comes out, you compare it to one of these captions for the image, uh, and you backpropagate. And you just train and train and train and train. You train the whole thing end-to-end, -end, and you should, uh, what I've seen from students, you should get pretty good results already. I mean, if you want real state of the art, you need something called an attention mechanism. We won't go into that today, but this is something you could do if you have a re relatively high-end laptop or a, a decent uh, gaming machine. This is something you could do on your own machine, uh, and you could get to work pretty quickly. And then you can do your own image captioning. So, final notes and summary. Uh, we talked about LSTMs. If you want to do word-level LSTMs, then you have these sort of huge input vectors, because you, if you do just plain one-hot one coding, you get an input vector of 10,000 or 100,000. Um, so what you can do is stick an embedding layer below your LSTM that embeds your words to these embedding vectors, and then you have a relatively small vectors to feed to your network. You can use pre-trained word-to-vec embeddings, or you can just uh, train the embeddings end-to-end -to -end together with the neural network. Uh, there's a couple of uh, competitors to LSTMs, things like Gru's, which I won't go into, but they're sort of other recurrent neural networks that work just as more or less the same. And one good thing to do is to use bidirectional L RNNs, which just uh, basically what you do is you feed your sequence in one direction to an LSTM and feed your sequence backwards, the reverse of your sequence, to another LSTM, and you concatenate their outputs. And then you get sort of, um, you can, yeah, you sort of learn to read your sequence in both directions. That can be uh, very useful, especially in the encoder part of an autoencoder. Uh, because then you don't have a bias for the things that happen at the end of your sequence. Uh, yeah, so last slide. Sequence modeling, we can do feature extraction and just use existing methods if we're a little bit careful about validation. But it's not as exciting as designing new models that actually know what sequences are and can consume sequences natively. Markov modeling is a very simple approach, very straightforward approach that's quite powerful given the huge assumption. word to vec is a good way to embed words uh, so that you can uh, learn, for, uh, for instance, that different words have roughly the same meaning. And then with LSTMs, uh, you get a very, very powerful model, but it's also a little bit more complicated, a little bit more difficult to train. Uh, and you have to understand it a little bit better. So that's sort of a spectrum of methods you can use to do sequence processing, from powerful to simple. And that's all I had for you today. Uh, join us on Thursday when we discuss matrix models and probably graph models. <laughs>